<laughs> I'm going to be hoarse because I, you know, they gave us a list about, you know, what we were supposed to do today. And so there was a thing on the list here at uh, 110, and it says Youth Breakout. And it said Father Gately. And Father Gately didn't show up, so they had to go to the second person, Father Larry Richards. So then I had to talk to those kids for 50 minutes because of Father Gately being somewhere else. I would have hit him back there, but he's too skinny right now. I think I'd kill him. Anyway. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Great God of love and mercy, set us on fire that we may do your will and spread your word. We beg you these things in your most holy name, amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, what I'm going to talk about is be a man who changed the world. It's the, the last chapter in my book, Be a Man, if you haven't read it. And, you know, it, it is uh, funny, the people that I, you know, I'd go, like, especially for Lent, for whatever reason. I was walking through Minneapolis Airport one day, and, and Father Larry Richards, I go, yeah, don't hit me. Why? What's the matter? He goes, me and my son read your book every Lent. It's our third Lent for doing it. I said, have you done all 30 things in the book? No. We haven't read the book. Go read the book and do the 30 things. Because at the end of each chapter, there's three things you must do to be a man. And at the very end, there's 30 things. We take them all and they have nice little check marks. So you have to check each one. If you read it, but you didn't do that, go back and read it. Anyway, be a man who changes the world. Gentlemen, you do realize that for Catholics, we're great doing the first thing that Jesus said, but not the second. Jesus said, come and follow me. Isn't it great? Yeah, okay, Jesus, I'll follow you. That's why we're all here today. Oh, I got the Holy Spirit. Everything's fine now. I'm blessed. But no, no, no. But then he says, go and make disciples. So gentlemen, I want you to think about the people you've brought to the devil in your life. You know what I'm talking about? So everybody here has brought someone to the devil. Meaning that when you weren't married or those who you aren't married and you had sex with your girlfriend, you brought her to the devil, right? I, I tell my boys all the time, they'd say, Father, I'm having sex outside of marriage. And I'd say, are you? Why? Because I'm in love, Father. I say, you love her a lot? Yes, I love her a lot. Well, every time you have sex with her, you kill her soul. So if she, after you have sex with her and she goes and she dies, and after she goes and uh, she dies, she goes to hell. And it was your fault because it says no fornicator went to the kingdom of heaven. Correct? So because you sat there and you had sex with her, you killed her soul. If you're a true man, you'll do everything to save her soul. So let's say you had sex outside of marriage. Okay, you just took someone by the hand and said, come here. I want you to know who I'm following now. Satan. You told a dirty joke. You gossiped with somebody. You sat there and you went golfing with someone instead of going, uh, uh, you went golfing instead of going to mass. Every time you sin with somebody, you went out and got drunk with them, you got high with them, you take them by the hand and say, come with me. I want you to know who I'm following now, and I want to introduce you to him. Satan. Now, you really hate my guts, don't you? Because everybody here has brought someone to the devil, I promise you. If you don't think so, it's because you have pride. You've brought a lot of people to the devil. You just don't even know it. So if I've asked you how many people you've brought to... See, didn't I tell you those other priests are so nice? You know, Father Gately's like a living saint. And then you got me coming up after him like, oh, please, except when he was picking on me. He will go to hell for that later. But anyway, <laughs> all the things, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this, but you picked on Father Larry Richards. Go to hell. Anyway, just so you know. The reality is of all of us have brought people to the devil. So if I was to ask you, how many people have you brought to Jesus Christ? How many people can say that I know Jesus Christ because of and instill your name? Put your name in that. Because what's going to happen, one of the questions God's going to ask you and me when we die are where are your brothers and sisters? Did you bring anybody else with you? And you can't sit there and say, oh, well, no, no, it was hard enough for me to get here. That's the problem. Our job is we're in, when we give our life to Jesus, I'm going to give you a second and do that in a minute, you take, uh, Jesus puts us in the uh, uh, lifeboat, uh, and everybody, and there's, we're in the lifeboat, and all these people are around us dying. You can't sit there. Do you know why most people died in, uh, when a Titanic sank? There was enough boats for everybody, but the people that are already on the boats, they wouldn't go back to help anybody else. 
So all those people died because of people's selfishness. Well, there's people dying around you all the time. Our job is to grab people, pick them up, and get them in the lifeboat. So the way we change the world is by changing people one at a time and bringing them into this relationship with Jesus Christ. But we can't do that. You know, I'm on the radio every week up here, I'm guessing, on, and I'm on uh, open line on Thursdays. And it's a live call-in talk show from 3 to 4. And my thing is a, the new evangelization. And the new evangelization is how do you bring people to Jesus Christ? Because that's the point. But before we can give, bring people to Jesus, we got to make sure that we're with Jesus, that we've surrendered our life to Jesus. Now, again, you can know a lot about Jesus. These other speakers, you know, both these priests are good holy priests, and they gave great talks. And they talk about, you know, especially Father Day this morning, he talked about entering this experience relationship with Jesus. But to do that, you have to enter in freely of your free will. Huh? Now, again, a lot of people, I have a lot of CDs and DVDs on and all, I'm on YouTube and everybody else. And so uh, every time, sometimes I go places, there's people that sit there and say, Father, I know all about you. I say, oh, you do. I've heard every one of your talks. Well, you might know my talks and you might heard my books, but you don't know me. Oh, yes, Father, I know every... Uh-uh, you sure don't know me. You know, when I was first doing this, we used to put out uh, tapes with the Mary Foundation, remember? And those were cassette tapes. Remember the cassette tapes, Dave? And so cassette tapes of me, I have my confession CD. And right on the confession CD, it said, for adults only. And so my boys at the high school I used to teach with used to say, Father Larry puts out adult tapes. <laughs> and it was true. It was. It was about because I talk explicitly on the confession CD. But in, 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 in doing these things, but my kids would always say to me, Father, how come you always sound so nice on those tapes? What are you trying to say? Father Larry isn't always nice. There's a humongous difference between knowing Father Larry and listening to Father Larry's tapes or on the radio. Because once you get to know me, it's like, I don't even think he's a nice person. I don't know where he got it from. You know, again, I'm very, 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 very beyond human. You know, I just uh, talk about, you want to know how bad I am? Just so you were wondering. I'll tell you how bad I am. Two, last, Saturday, last Saturday I spoke in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I was doing a men's conference. So I'm getting on, you know, and I've been sick and everything else these last weeks, and I just, you know, I, I'm getting on the plane in uh, the Detroit to get to Green Bay. And so the first class gets called in. I'm not in the first class. I'm usually, I can be because I'm a platinum flyer normally. And then our class gets in. And as we're walking in, this guy literally pushed me aside and went in front of me. All the people behind me were saying stuff. I said something in my head to him that came out of my mouth. And it wasn't very good. It began with an A and ends with a hole. You understand? <laughs> so here I am, full clerics. <laughs> Father Gately wouldn't say anything like that. But Father Larry Richards, in front of everybody, called this guy that word, and I didn't think it came out of my mouth, but he turned around and he looked at me and I says, so you're better than the rest of us? And I thought, Someone needs a video camera and they'll put this on YouTube about the way Father Larry Richards really is. This is me, people. A great sinner, great temper still to this day, and yet the Lord still chooses to use a jackass like me. And he can still use a jackass like you. That's the point. Because you've done stupid things in your life, and those few of you that are looking at me like now, I've never done that ever. Oh, let's ask your wife about you for a minute. Let's just do that. But we all have our own sinfulness. If anger isn't your sinfulness, God bless you. You might have lust, which takes you in deeper. Or you might have gossip. Or you might have pride. Or you can fill in the blank. We all deserve being far from God. And so, but the God of the universe, as Father Gately so nicely talked about, is a God of great mercy. My greatest devotion is to mercy. But we need to truly be disciples of Jesus. And the boy to be a disciple is, again, Father Dave talked about the gift of the Holy Spirit earlier today. And uh, that's when I was talking to kids, so I couldn't be there for the whole thing. But the reality is, when he talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, there's a great book out on uh, the Holy Spirit, and it's called The Forgotten God. 
And in his book, The Forgotten God, this, uh, the, the guy tells a story about what if a guy wanted to be the best football player in the whole wide world? And he calls and he prays, God, I want to be the best football player. I want to be the best football player. I want to be the best football player. And God appears to him and says, what do you want? I want to be the best football player. He says, okay, this is what's going to happen. I will live inside of you and I will play football for you. Would you expect that guy to be a good football player? The best! Well, see, this is what happens to us. God says, I want you to be a Christian, the best. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to live inside of you and I will live the Christian life for you. Don't you expect us to be better than we are? The problem is, is when we get in the way of Jesus. But you know, when I drop dead at 120 because the good die young, it'll have on my gravestone Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, my favorite verse of the Bible. And Galatians chapter 2, 19 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. So the life I live now is no longer my own. Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I still live my human life, yes, but it's a life of faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. You do realize being a Christian isn't what we do for God. It's what God has done for us. Most Catholics are Pelagianists. You know what a Pelagianist is? It's a heresy. And what's Pelagianism? Do you know? We earn our own salvation. And if you're not a Pelagianist, you're a Neo-Pelagianist. You know what Neo-Pelagianism is? Jesus does 50% and you do 50%. All of that is heresy. We are saved by grace. It's what he did for us, not what we do for him. You know, you, the first one I told you earlier, the first one we know that went to heaven next to the, the Jesus Christ was who? The good thief, not the blessed mother. The good thief. He was bad his whole life, and then he stole heaven in the end. Right? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. This is grace. Read Romans. It's grace. This is what it's all about. It's about grace. It's what God does for us. But what has to happen, gentlemen, for you to receive the grace is you got to die. Hmm. So I've invited you all here today <laughs> to kill you. Aren't you excited? But I'm, I'm very serious. You need to be crucified with Jesus. You need to die. Now, again, some of you look at me and all those great sacramental people because you know everything and I'm just a stupid priest. You can go on, you can go on Facebook later and go on a tie a tribe against me, join everybody else that does that, and say, oh, how holy you are and how miserable that Father Larry Rich. I think he's a liberal. Anyway, so you go ahead and you go do that. But let me tell you something. What has to happen is for you and I, we need to die. Now, you say, well, I died at baptism, Father. Yes, you did. But what is necessary to receive any sacrament, gentlemen, for it to be valid? Not grace, that's already there. What opens grace? Faith. So that's why so many of our kids, they get confirmed and nothing happens. Why? Because they have no faith. You know the teaching of the church, remember Thomas Aquinas? If, if a priest drops the host at Mass... And a mouse comes and eats that host. Does he receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus? Yes. No. Why? Because he does not have faith. Gentlemen, a lot of you have received Jesus every week, but nothing happens. Why doesn't anything happen? No faith. Faith is what's necessary in a sacrament to unlock the sacrament. When a baby's baptized, whose faith do we count on? The parents. But now it comes to a time when you have to do that. Let's say I give you a million dollars and it's all wrapped up. Here, it's a gift. God and the church gave us a gift of baptism, eternal life. Here is a gift. But what's happened? Nothing. For most of us, we've never opened the gift. And then you will die of starvation. Because you never opened the gift. I gave you a million dollars, but you never opened it. Some of you have never opened the gift of your baptism. Most of you are Catholic. Why? Because when you were little bitty babies, your mommy and daddy took you to church. They baptized, the priest baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. The, you come back home and they said, 
As long as you live in this house, this is what you'll believe. You're okay, I believe it, I believe it. It's not faith. So what faith is, faith isn't faith until there's nothing left to hold on to. So faith encourages us to die, to let go of the rope, to let go of our life, to say, God, again, the way you can tell if you have faith is everything is under the lordship of Jesus. So those of you who still use artificial birth control, you have no faith because you're the Lord of your sexual life. Those of you got yourself snip, 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 snip. Why you ever let a person down there with a pair of scissors, I don't know. But what you do is you say, I'm in charge of my sexual life. I am, not God. That means you don't have faith. It's all about you. Faith is in faith until there's nothing left to hold on to. So this is what I'm going to tell you a story, gentlemen, and then I'm going to let you make a decision. It's a story about a man from Crete. I love Crete. Anybody know where Crete is? It's a little island off of Greece. And there's this old man there. He loved the land of Crete, and the whole land of Crete loved him. He would sit there every day, work with his, uh, the olives, and every day he'd work with the grapes, whatever is in season. When a baby was born, he'd be the first one there to kiss the baby. When someone died, he'd be the first one there to sit there and uh, offer his condolences. He loved the whole land of Crete, and the whole land of Crete loved him. Well, one day he got to be 99 years old, which means he was going to die. So he told his 10 sons, or it used to be just 10 sons, but the women got on my case. So I gave the guy a four-year-old daughter, huh? Not bad for a 99-year-old guy. Explain it to the person next to you, you pagan. Anyway, so he told his sons and daughters and his grandkids and his great-grandkids, and he says, I'm about ready to die. Take me and lay me on my beloved Crete. And his good Catholic children, they obeyed. And they laid him on his Crete, and he could feel the sun beat down on his face and the air go through his hair. And he looked around all his friends and relatives, and he was so happy. And he took a handful of the dirt of Crete, and he goes, this is a symbol of everything I ever loved. And he closes fingers and he closes his eyes in death. When he opens his eyes again, there he goes before the pearly gates of heaven. And they really are pearly, don't you know? But when the gates of heaven opened, God came out. And God kind of looked like Judge Wapner of the people's court. Remember him? He just died this past week. He had the long black judgment robes, but he had a beard. And he says, old man number 300 billion, 406. You've loved me, you've loved others. Come on home, enjoy eternal life. And the old man starts walking toward those pearly gates, and God looks down and says, what is it you have in your hand? And the old man says this. He goes, yeah, that. He says, it's Crete. It's everything I've ever, ever loved. It's everything I've ever loved. And God says, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no dirty hands in heaven. Huh? He says, you've got to make a decision. I'll give you anything you want. You choose me in heaven, or you choose Crete. I choose Crete. It's the everything I've ever loved. It's the only thing I've ever loved. God says, okay, I love you. I will give you what you love the most. If that's it, that's fine. And God sadly walks in the gates, in the gates of heaven, and the gates of heaven close behind him. Now, I don't know if you've ever held on dirt for any length of time, but all the moisture was going on. It was becoming like sand. He's desperately trying to hold on. This time the gates of heaven open again. Now, don't anybody get scandalized. It's my favorite image of God. God comes out as a barbarian beer meister, huh? He has the hat with the feather, he has the knicker shorts on, he has the high socks, he has the suspenders, and he has a beer stein filled with beer. Yah, 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 yah. He says, old man, we're having a party and it's for you. Come on home, enjoy eternal life. And the old man says, can I bring my Crete? God says, no, you can't bring your Crete. And the old man says, and I'm not coming, huh? God said, fine, go to hell. <laughs> No, he didn't. But he's the only one that can, isn't he? But the old God walked in the pearly gates, the pearly gates closed. Now this old man's really holding on to this, and it's all dust now, and it's just sifting through his fingers. And finally the gate of heaven opens one last time. And God comes out as the boy Jesus, no more than four years old. And he goes up to the old man and says, what you doing? <laughs> what you doing? My favorite cartoon in the whole world is Phineas and Ferb. None of you adults know that, but the kids know it's my favorite thing ever. Phineas and Ferb. Anyway, what you doing? And God looks at the old man and says, let me go. How dare you call yourself a God of love? If you were a God of love, you wouldn't ask me to give up the only thing I have left. This is the only thing I love. How would you ask me, a God of love, to give up this? And Jesus looked at him and says, old man, just looks like a bunch of dirt to me. Old man, let dust go to the wind. Grab my hand and come home. And the old man thought about how desperately he was holding on to this. And so finally he opened his hands, sadly, 
And the ruah, the breath, the wind, the spirit of God came and blew everything he had away. And sadly, he bent down and he took the boy Jesus' hand. And together they start walking towards the gates of heaven. Jesus is the only way in, you know. And as they walk into the gates of heaven, the gates of heaven close behind him. And this man is so sad. And he looks up. And he starts to laugh. Because what was there? The whole land of Crete. Everything he ever loved. Everything he ever wanted. Gentlemen, what is it that you hold on to so tightly today that you can't surrender it to receive everything God wants to give you? What do you want? With God, you have everything. Without God, you have nothing. A couple weeks ago, we reminded you, remember, man, that you are dust, and unto dust you shall return. That's truth. Gentlemen, I make you a promise. You are going to die promise some of you will become dust faster than others because you're going to get cremated i don't want to burn anyway after i die but go whatever with you like some of you will be buried and you'll be eaten by the worms and come out the other side as dust but i promise you you will all and i will become dust unless jesus comes in our lifetime but we're going to become dust you will die i promise you can be dust forever or today at this place you can surrender your dust of who you are to him. And he'll take your life and he'll give you his. But this is something you got to do. Now, every day I give my life to Jesus. And I gave my life to Christ when I was 17 years old. And every day I re-give my life to him. You know why? Because sometimes I take it back within 10 minutes. I got to keep surrendering, keep surrendering. When I called that guy a bad word the other day, it's because I took my life back. Jesus wasn't living. I had him tied up inside of me when I did that. I got to get up, repent, and start over. So, uh, gentlemen, so this is what I'm going to ask you. Those who want, now please, this is your decision. You do it because you want to do it, not because everybody else did it. Well, it's time for you to man up. You decide what you're going to do. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, on March the 11th, 2017, then give your life to Jesus publicly. If you don't, just sit there. And know this. This is a consequence that has eternal consequences. God will give you what you want. If you want him, fine. If you don't want him, fine. But you get to make that decision. God believes in complete free choice when it comes to this. You get to decide whether you want Christ to come in and take care and change your heart or whether you want to live life the way you want to live life. So I know all of you can't stand. There's some of people in wheelchairs, but those who can stand and those who want, you're just going to stand with me and repeat the prayer that I'm going to say. So those who want to give their life to Christ or recommit their life to Christ, please stand with me now. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And I am sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Take control of my life. Be my Lord and God and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And make me your disciple. I love you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I give you my life forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, these your sons have committed or recommitted their lives to you. Jesus, fill them now with your Holy Spirit, not a cowardly spirit, but one that will make them strong, loving, and wise. Help them to be your disciples and make them go forth from this place and make disciples of all nations. We beg you these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So, gentlemen, what you just did changed your life forever. You gave your life publicly to Jesus Christ. So if anybody ever comes to you and says, hey, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? They go, yeah. Okay, yeah, when? And you say, March 11, 2017 at West Catholic High School in Grand Rapids, Michigan at 2... 
at 3.30 of the hour of mercy. Now get out of my face, you. <laughs> what you just did is a brand new beginning for you, gentlemen. Now for Billy Graham, that's the end. For us, it's now the beginning. Now you got to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to tell you what you have to do to be a disciple, okay? Before you can make disciples, you got to be a disciple. The first thing you got to do to be a disciple of Jesus is you have to sit at the feet of the master. What's the first thing you got to do? That means that you pray every day. You spend time with Jesus. You don't try to pray, gentlemen, every day. You pray. And you go to the word. I have this saying. You already heard it. I didn't preach on this because I preached on it last time I was here. No Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. You start your day reading the Word of God and you end your day reading the Word of God. You begin your day with God and you end your day with God. Now you're sitting at the feet of the Master. The problem is you sit at the wrong Master's feet. Some of you spend more time watching sports than you do praying. Duh! You know nobody gives a damn about you and your sports. Do you know that? The Packers aren't going to save you. The Steelers aren't going to save you. The, no one's going to save you. They don't care. But you waste so much time. You can tell you belong to you walk in your house and what do you see? Do you see a crucifix or do you see an emblem for a sports team? How very sad that most of us sit at the master of the sports. Or some of you, your master has been money. Or some of you, your master has been your health and your body and your ripples in your stomach. I don't care about your six pack, I have a case. But that whole reality is, you spend your time and energy. Gentlemen, what you love and who you're a master, who's your master is who you spend time with. So you have to sit at the feet of the master. You just gave your life to Jesus Christ. What does that mean? You died. Your old life is over. Now the devil will love to keep you focused on yourself and focused on your past. It's done. You just gave your life publicly to Jesus. Now you live and you focus on Jesus and you focus on the future. So now every day you spend time sitting at the feet of the master, Jesus. You pray and you read his word because this will tell you how you are to live. So the first thing you got to do is sit at the feet of the master. The second thing you got to do is you got to have, you have to be Sit at the feet of the master. You got to uh, uh, be. Um, what is the second thing you got to do? <laughs> you got to have the thoughts of the master. You got to think like the master, huh? And to do that, meaning that you have to start thinking the way God thinks, right? That you got to start thinking not about the way a Democrat would think or a Republican would think. You think the way. Jesus thinks. you got to have his will. you got to have one purpose in life. You know, Father Gately talked about, I wear this thing. I've given my life to Jesus through Mary many times. When I first got ordained, I gave my life to the Blessed Mother. And every year on my anniversary, I go back and re-give my priesthood and my life to the Blessed Mother. Now, I wear this chain on my hand to remind me I am a slave of God. Right? So what does a slave mean? It doesn't matter what I want. I exist to please him. I exist to do his will. When you become a disciple of Jesus, you got to think that way. I exist to do God's will. Period. So again, that's why when you're praying, you got to listen. That's why you got to go to his word so he can tell you what he wants you to do. But you need to sit there and become a slave of Jesus Christ. Become a slave, whatever that means. And then you got to listen so he can tell you. And then finally, so the first thing you got to do is you got to sit at the feet of the master. You got to think like the master. And the third thing you got to do is you got to be transformed into the master. What's the third thing you got to be transformed into the master? Now, what does this mean? Most people think to be a Christian means you're trying hard to live a moral life. That's a lie just is. Can you be a Muslim and live a moral life? Can you be an atheist and live a moral life? Can you be a Buddhist and live a mortal life? Yes. They do it all the time, people. If you don't think they do, it's because you don't know any of them. 
They live very moral lives. To be a Christian does not mean you live a moral life. To be a Christian means you no longer live. Jesus Christ lives inside of you. You just gave your life to Christ. You died. You no longer live. Jesus Christ lives inside of you. What does that mean? You got to get out of the way and show the world Jesus. Because you're not going to save anybody. I'm not going to save anybody. I swear at people in lines. But Jesus will save people. And so you got to sit there and get out of the way and let the world see Jesus. And so a great, great story for that is, you know, one question everybody asks you and me is, sir, I would like to see Jesus. And that's what we got to do is show him Jesus. We'll all show Jesus a different side. Jesus is big enough that we can all show a different face of Jesus. But one of the greatest stories I heard, I love to tell it. I don't tell it much on, uh, I tell it all my missions, but in all the, not all the men's conferences. And it's a story about a man who was captured in the Second World War. And he was an American Christian. And he was thrown in this Japanese prisoner of war camp. At the same time, there was a Japanese man who uh, was helping the Americans. So he was considered a traitor. And him, they treated very poorly. But they threw him in the same cell with the American. And as they tortured this Japanese man and threw him into the cell with the American, the American would take his own food and give it to the Japanese man and would try best as he could to heal the wounds of this man. And this happened for about a month. At the end of the month, they tortured a Japanese man so badly that when they threw him back in the cell, the American knew he wasn't going to make it the night. And so he knelt next to him and he goes, you know, you're probably going to die tonight. But if you just surrender your life to Jesus, you will live forever. You know what the Japanese man said to the American? He said, if this Jesus is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Gentlemen, could your wife say that about you? Oh, honey bun. <laughs> if Jesus is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. You in high school, could your friends at school, the people you pick on, could they say, oh, Joe, if Jesus is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Could your neighbors say that about you? Oh, so-and-so, if Jesus Christ is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Could your kids say that about you? Boys, could your parents say that about you? Do you, if you're an employer, could your employee say, if Jesus Christ is anything like my boss, I can't wait to meet him. Because what a Christian is, gentlemen, is another Christ. Our job is to bring the world to Jesus Christ. And we do that by getting out of the way, right? That's what we got to do. And so once you and I decide, okay, we've done the first part. I've given my life to Jesus Christ publicly today. My life is not my own. I have been crucified with Christ. I have died. From this moment for the rest of my life is a new beginning. The past is gone. It's over with. It's done. I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So for the rest of my life to be a disciple, I will sit at his feet every day. I will think the way he thinks, and I will be Christ in the world to others. Once you start doing that, talk about changing the world, gentlemen. Christ is who changes the world. Not me, not you, not Obama, not Trump. Jesus Christ changes the world. And the reality is, he is in you and me. Now, the problem is, a lot of us curse darkness. Oh, we love when we get to watch speakers and say how bad it is. Yep, life sucks, gentlemen. So what? You ever been in a dark room, and no matter how dark the darkness is, it's intense darkness. If I come here and I light a match and I light a candle, no matter how intense the darkness is, it can never conquer the light. The light is always stronger. So are you part of the problem, you curse darkness? Because cursing the darkness just increases darkness and it envelops you with darkness. Or are you the light in the darkness? Jesus Christ said about us, we are the light of the world. The way we bring light to the world is we get out of the way because the light of Jesus Christ is inside of us. You know, people ask me all the time, Father, where do you get your energy? You know where I get my energy? The Holy Spirit sets me on fire and people come to watch me burn. 
that same Holy Spirit has been given to you gentlemen. You can sit there and hide it and say, oh, I have to take care of myself and go to hell. Or you can sit there and be the light of Christ in the darkness and bring the light of Christ to the darkness of the world. It doesn't help at all as we do is judge everybody else. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world. And John 3.17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. What is your job when it comes to the world, gentlemen? Save it. Stop cursing the darkness. You know, the people that pick on Pope Francis, I say, you know what you are? You're an accuser. And what does an accuser, who is the accuser? Satan. Satan. So when you go against a light in this world because he doesn't have the same theology as you, you become an accuser. You follow Satan. That's where you become. Stop cursing darkness. Be light. And the way of to practically be light is I'm going to teach you how to bring people to Jesus. Are you ready? And then I get out of here because I got to be on a plane and go home. I can't wait. The first thing you got to do, gentlemen, is you got to sit there and you got to have a list. Start a prayer list of everyone you know that doesn't know Jesus Christ. Start with your family. But start with people you work for. And I want you to start praying for these people every day. Because, gentlemen, the greatest thing you can do for anybody is pray for them. The sun is out today in Grand Rapids. It doesn't come out much in Erie. But you ever go out in the sun and you take a magnifying glass and you put a magnifying glass out in the rays and it takes the rays of the sun and it focuses it on a, something and it sets it on fire. Is that true? When you pray for people, gentlemen, you become a spiritual magnifying glass. And when you place yourself over them, the grace of God, which is everywhere, focuses through you and sets them on fire. If you want to go to the next level, you start fasting on bread and water on Fridays for them. People in your family that go to church, it's because you're not fasting the way you need to. You start fasting on bread and water and you start praying for them. You have their name, you put your hand over their name every day. Jesus, bring them to a knowledge of you. You fast and pray, you become this powerful spiritual magnifying glass. You watch what God does. So the first thing to do to bring others to Christ is you pray for them. The second thing you got to do is you got to love them. What's the second thing you got to do? Love them. You got to love them so much that they think there's, you know, Teresa, a little flower, as Father Gately talked about nicely. She didn't like someone in the convent. You know, saints didn't like people either. She struggled with depression, clinical depression. But there was a woman in the convent, another nun, that she couldn't stand. So what did she do? She acted as if she loved her more than any of them. She went out of her way to be nice to this woman. And one day the nun comes to her and says, Sister, what is it about me that you like so much? And she hated her guts. But she loved her for Christ. You and I got to start loving people. So the first thing, and you got to do it in this order. Do not get it out of this order. You pray for them and then you love them. And then what's the last thing you do to witness to others, to bring them to Christ? You tell them. And what do you tell them? You tell them about what Jesus has done for you. And that's called a witness. You give witness about what Jesus in his love has done for you. So you should be able to have a story about this is the way I was before Jesus. And this is the way I am now. And you don't just push it on them. You ask the Holy Spirit, you pray the Holy Spirit every day, give me the opportunity to bring this person to you. And then he will. And don't shove it. You know, I can't stand these people. That, you know, they meet somebody and you're living in sin, you know you could go to hell. I'm just doing a spiritual work of mercy, Father. You keep your mouth shut unless they know you love them. Period. Don't you tell anybody anything unless they know you love them. So you pray for them. You love them, and then you tell them. And then they can come to Christ. And now I, I've used this for 30 years, gentlemen. I promise you it works. You know, the reality is that when I sit there and we talk about Jesus created you and me, not just to take care of our families, but to take care of the world. The world is in darkness. And the world is in darkness because of us. We need to be this light in the darkness. And you do that by being disciples and by making disciples. 
So if you and I decide today, here's 1,200 men in this room. If us 1,200, you do realize Jesus changed the world with 12 men. And one of them was messed up and betrayed him. Jesus changed the world with 11. And then he brought on another later after the resurrection. But if Jesus can do anything with 12 men, what can he do with 1,200 men? who want to live their life for Christ and Christ alone, who have become slaves for Christ and Christ alone, whose goal in life is to bring everyone they know into a relationship with Jesus, whose goal in life is to, instead of cursing the darkness, of lighting a light in the midst of the darkness and changing the darkness into light. You have the power. Because remember, Jesus says, go and pray that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And Father David already prayed for that for you, did he not? And he said, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why would you receive power? Then you will be my witnesses. So gentlemen, go out and be light. I make you a promise, gentlemen, I'm going to be done four minutes early. Aren't you excited? But I make you a promise every day for the rest of my life. I'm going to pray for you at least twice a day. I promise. But I ask you as Father already asked you if you would pray for me. Because let's be really real here, huh, gentlemen? You've never met a more arrogant priest in your life, have you? <laughs> you didn't like some of the things I said, did you? You thought a priest shouldn't do that. I know. The devil has already asked for me. And if you would please promise, if you have a prayer list, to put me on it and to pray for me. If you're on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, you go to Father Larry Richards. I'll send you a scripture every morning and every night. But gentlemen, what I need more than anything is your prayers. Men need men. I need you. And I promise you that I too will pray for you every day. You got it? Get it? Gonna live it? May you know his love today and forever. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you. He who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, gentlemen.